Next up is Tony the Coster. Tony the Coster. Currently, Mr. Tony works directly for the director in charge of digital economy and coordination in the DG Connect of the European Commission. He deals notably with designing the digital single market, as well as with innovation policy for ICT companies and with copyright. Previously, he was deputy head of unit in charge of the Innovation Union and DG Research and Innovation. Before that, he was in charge of designing and implementing the European 2020 Strategy for Growth and Jobs at the Secretary General of the European Commission. In the framework of these tasks, at the height of the 2008 economic crisis, he helped draw up European Plan for Econo Economic Recovery, which was subsequently endorsed by the December 2008 European Council. His speech today is titled Creating a True European Digital Single Market. Put your hands together and welcome Tony de Coster to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. It's really a quite impressive crowd here. And it's a big honor to be invited to be able to, to speak. Well, I would like immediately to thank uh, Per Henrik for his presentation because he set out a lot of what we think in the European Commission that is really going to happen. I, mean, I don't think we've used the terms golden age, but uh, that we are in a transformation towards a digital economy, a digital society. I mean, that is very, very clear. And the, the challenge ahead of us, and then what I would like to talk to you about uh, today, this morning, is how we, as a European Union, as European economic area, i.e. including Iceland, how we can make sure that we create the best conditions for, for ourselves, for this phenomenon to, to happen and that we can benefit from it. I think, I mean, the first <coughs> issue is, is to remember the context in which uh, today we still are. The economic situation is still very complicated. Um, we still have slow growth. Uh, we're still struggling to get out of the crisis, which, uh, which is really uh, faced which we had to face now for, for six, seven years, which is a very, very long period. We're still facing very high levels of unemployment in the European Union, and that is in particular affecting our youth. So it's, it's really critical that we get out of the situation, that we use all the, um, the benefits which, which are available to us and make sure that the generation, the young generation of now will will drive these changes and that they do not remain stuck in, in very high unemployment. So we heard in the previous presentation already how digital has changed the world and how in the coming years, because I truly believe that what Per Hendrik said, it is happening now, um, that that is absolutely true, that we make sure that we benefit from this transformation to a digital economy, a digital society. What does that mean uh, beside the connected objects, which uh, we saw a lot of in the previous presentation? It's also no longer just about the ICT sector itself, which is very represented here, but it, the phenomenon now goes into all sectors, all traditional sectors. So for Europe, it's also about maintaining jobs, maintaining the competitiveness of those traditional jobs of automotive, financial services, pharmaceuticals, you name it. Because this digital economy means not just the connected things which are coming, big data, uh, cloud computing, but it means also that the way in which companies produce goods, deliver services, is changing fundamentally. That phenomenon is, is really happening as, as we speak. And, yeah, well, you see here a few of the, um, of the sort of uh, figures, I mean, a lot of figures, and, but the one which really strikes me is the one at the top right there, which says that 7% of our GDP uh, really stems now already from, um, from this digital economy. 
and you see that the little bubble there with 4.4 of the ICT sector around it, you have a much wider bubble, which is really this ICT in other sectors. That's, that's the phenomenon which we are witnessing now. And this is about Europe, but um, again, as we saw in the previous presentation, it's a global phenomenon. So it is really also about, uh, about our global competitiveness that we have to, we have to do this. Now, in the European Union, we have one major asset um, to be able to compete on this global scene, and that is our internal market. More than 500 million consumers within one single market. You know it for physical goods, physical service, you benefit from it every day. You move around freely within this, um, within this European Union, within this single market, and you do your economic activities there. Now, however, we do not yet have that single market for digital goods and digital services, as I will explain in, in, in my presentation, and that's what we're really working on. Again, here, a brief overview of uh, how it is affecting all of our, of our sectors. So it is not no longer a policy which is just about ICT, it's about the, the, entire, the entire economy. It is, as I explained, increasingly about jobs. Yeah. But the question then is, um, how are we as European Union, as European economic area, how are we doing in this global shift? And unfortunately, some of these comparisons with other of our major competitors are not always to, to our advantage. It is clear, for example, that the um, US, just to take that example because we did massive studies on this, are um, doing much better in using ICT to raise their productivity, to make uh, productivity gains. So this is something clearly where we, where we need to catch up. Um, also, in terms of the ICT revenues, okay, this is the ICT sector per se. Um, again, we're, we're, not, we're not in the best position. We would want to see uh, the blue be as, just as long as, uh, as the green, really. And also, I mean, you, you know, there are lots of very innovative digital web entrepreneur companies in Europe, that is the very, very positive trend which we see. It's maybe also even a result of the crisis that a lot of young people have um, gone into these new, in, in, into these new uh, sectors, have developed new apps, I mean, massively. But those are mostly, let's be frank, the small companies. And we also know there is massive amount of studies around that in Europe, that we have a difficulty to make small companies grow into larger companies. And if then one looks at the larger ICT companies, then it is true that we must see that there is quite a bit of a domination, or again, of non-European uh, European firms. Well, you, you see this slide here, you know them. So the challenge for us, again, with this, the advent of the Internet of Things, of big data, cloud, and so on, is to make sure that also our traditional companies, where we are, of course, if you would take that slide, we rank much better in terms of car manufacturing, mechanical engineering, and so on, but that those companies make that shift properly, that we create the conditions so that they can um, take over the shift and that we keep them up in the, uh, in the highest slots here. So, that is um, a bit of the international context, and also we've done studies which demonstrate that at the end of the day, this digital single market is also the political legal initiative in the European Union, in the European economic area, which can generate most growth. I mean, look at this. I mean, this is a study done by the European Parliament 250 billion can be gained by 2020 if we manage to get it right and create a true digital single European market. That doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't do the other things as well, like our international trade with the, the US, so-called TTIP, or completing financial markets integration, or, or creating the banking union, which, of course, is critically important to, uh, 
to solidify financial stability in the European Union. But the potential benefits are, 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 are huge, so there can be no, um, no doubt about it. Thus, this must be done. Now, a lot has already been done in terms of political, legal initiatives in the European Union to, um, to create the right environment for, for digital. Back in the 1990s, 1998, 1st of January 1998, we liberalized the telecoms market, and that has been, of course, a massive boost for investments in this sector. Investments, competition, better services, innovation. I mean, you always... would. You experience that every day. One shouldn't forget that at the initial stage of this was an initiative by the, by the European Commission, by the European Union to liberalize that. We've set standards which became world um, successes, such as GSM, such as UMTS for the third generation mobile communications. We did away um, with the excessive roaming charges, we imposed a legal framework to keep the roaming charges within very well kept boundaries in the European Union so that we can also um, travel around and still enjoy our connectivity. But that doesn't mean that more shouldn't be done. Now through the Europe 2020 strategy for growth and jobs, uh, we've also created a framework with a so-called um, flagship initiative around the digital agenda, whereby we set very clear and, and ambitious broadband targets for the European Union, which most of which have, have been achieved, or, or we are on the way of achieving those which are set for, for the horizon of uh, 2020. And I think, <coughs> besides these legal or political initiatives, the very positive development which we also see at the political front is that, you know, from a sectorial file, over time, the importance of it has been recognized by political leaders. And for the first time in November 2013, the European Council, that means heads of state and government, when they meet at their summits, have for the first time in November 2013 dedicated a European summit to, to digital and set an ambitious uh, political agenda uh, as well. So a lot has been done, but I'm afraid we're not yet there. We do not yet have that digital single market. I mean, you will have come across the limitations. You try to do online um, e-commerce, for example. You try to do a price comparison on the sites of Zara, for example. Look what a Zara dress would cost in Spain and what it would cost in Iceland or in Copenhagen or whatever. And you cannot simply not access some of these websites because there are issues like geo-blocking or geo-redirectioning. That's uh, just to quote an example. So, whereas the internet does away or did away with uh, the factors of distance and time, whereas it massively disintermediated the, the economy, we see new types of, um, of barriers to that single market appear. And those are the ones that we, we need to, to tackle now. I mean, besides the sort of anecdotal uh, example which I gave you of activities which we do online and which we are hindered when we try to do them cross-border, there are also some figures which we, we get out of the yearly scoreboard, our, our digital scoreboard, which we do every year, which are quite telling. 14% of SMEs use the internet to sell online. 24 in Iceland, so clearly doing better. But still, that means that 76% of SMEs are not using the internet to sell online. 12% um, of consumers shop online across borders. 12% only. 88% of European citizens do not for whatever reason, shop online across borders. So they're not probably even getting the best deal. So I said that there are many reasons for this, and I think it's important that we, 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 we stand still for the, on those for, for a little second, because that is the initiative which we're taking now, and which will result in a digital single market strategy with a lot of regulatory or non-regulatory actions taken as a result thereafter in May of this year. 
And those precisely will look at the, the barriers to that single market which we need to tackle. The first type of barrier is regulatory fragmentation. I mean, laws, consumer law, um, applicable consumer law is different in our member states, in the European economic area. Data privacy is regulated in a different way, although there is a common basis of harmonization, but still member states and the countries of the European Union adapt it. Taxation is differently. It's differently across member states, but it's also often different for online and the same type of, of offline services or products. Liability issues, we heard it in the presentation on the Internet of Things. These are critically important. You take the connected car that was and the free riding car which will now be tested by Mercedes on the uh, A9 motorway track in, in, uh, in, in Germany, in Bavaria. That's fine, that's within one country, so okay, there are still issues of liability. Who is liable between the, the software producer, the manufacturer of the car, the one that receives uh, the data and so on and so forth. But imagine that if that car, st that car starts crossing the border. The complexity of it becomes much more important, and that shouldn't be the case. Let alone that that car, in connecting, if it crosses the border, will be faced with roaming charges. So we have to really get this get get this right. Um, so regulatory fragmentation is the first. Territorial restrictions is, of course, the second one. Uh, you geo blocking, geo redirectioning. Those are practices which we see a lot, and not just for copyright protected um, content, but also simply for digital goods and digital services. Imp interoperability issues arise, which are really important, for example, for the cloud. You put your data on one cloud service. Do you want to become locked in? Clearly, those are issues that need to, to be looked at. There are the questions of access to platforms creating transparency on how search results are being presented and so on, I think are also issues which are, of course, on our minds. Then there is the cost of shipping. Studies show that when you buy online across the border, then all of a sudden the, shop, the, sorry, the, the, the delivery cost, by the sheer fact that you cross the border, can increase sevenfold or eightfold compared to a similar type of distance within one country. Those are, of course, you know, clearly barriers which, uh, which are impeding this digital single market to happen. And then, of course, you have the issues of trust and security, which are also critically important. Trust marks are a solution, but do we have the right set of tools to make sure that they are comparable within the European Union, that you know when you go on to a, a Spanish or or a German website, what these, what these trust marks means, and of course the, the issues of security are, are critically important. As said, um, our intention is um, to take a major initiative in May 2005. And I already said it, there is, a, there is a game changer here at political level. There is a realization within the European Union at the highest level through the European Council that something has to be done about this digital single market. And now as a new commission, headed by um, Mr. Juncker came in in October of last year. Mr. Juncker, our new president, set this very, very clear objective that we have, should have this connected digital single market and we should break down, you see it here, this, this quotation, national silos and telecoms regulation in copyright and data protection legislation, in the management of radio spectrum and in the application of competition law. So besides the specific initiative on the digital single market in May, there are some more specific issues which we need to look at. Copyright, I already mentioned, is, is another one. Because, of course, our copyright regime is probably, in this global competition, not fit for purpose anymore for the digital age. I mean, it's still very, very relevant, but we need to make sure that we enable for right holders to grow the pie and take advantage of what is offered, the possibilities that are offered by, the, um, by digitization to sell more and 
uh, of their content. It also builds, of course, on a telecom single market. I mean, the connectivity, the networks themselves also have to be uh, integrated. There has to be a competitive single market for that as well. A proposal, a legal proposal to do that has already been put on the table and is currently being discussed in the Parliament and the Council with a proposal to do away with roaming over time and, of course, to also uh, create a clear, predictable legal framework for net neutrality. We also have made a proposal on network information uh, security and on data protection, mm, where a, a draft regulation again is on the table <laughs> of the European Council and, and, and the Parliament and is under discussion for the moment. But besides that, those legal initiatives, there is another very fundamental issue, and I, I read the, 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 the objective of this conference, which said was to create more, make this, this, these jobs in this area also much more attractive for young people, for women often as well. And that's also something which we're working on, because of course we, we, that's the ambiguous situation for the moment. On the one hand, we have high unemployment, in particular affecting young people, women, and on the other hand, we have a lack of ICT skills. Yeah, whilst this big phenomenon is all happening, so how can it happen if we don't have the skills for it? Now this is of course, at the European level, it's a bit tricky because the, um, the responsibility, as you know very well, for education is something which member states, often even regions, keep very close to their hearts. So our competences at the European level to do something there are, are somewhat limited. But still we have taken something some, some initiatives, some political initiatives, uh, and together with industry to tackle this skills gap, which we estimate will be 900,000 people by 2020. So our skills gap would amount to 900,000 people. Uh, we set up together with industry a so-called grand coalition for jobs, for digital jobs, whereby these companies, large players in the digital sector, but also outside, together with universities and so on, make pledges, offer traineeships, offer uh, MOOCs and what have you, um, to, um, to, 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 to create new possibilities for people to go into these, um, these ICT jobs. We also supported and, and launched the so-called European Code Week. You all know the Code Week in the US, which is massively popular. And that is something uh, which we want to, in a sense, also uh, make happen in, in the European Union. So back in October, together with industry again, and with educational systems, we, we, we uh, set up this EU Code Week, which was about 3,000 events which were launched in one week in 37 countries. And in the end, 100,000 youngsters, but also teachers participated. So that makes us uh, quite positive and something which we want to continue doing over the next uh, years. Now, who would benefit? That is so clear. I mean, I don't have to explain this to you here. You will benefit, both as entrepreneurs, as citizens, we will benefit, you know, and that is true for all of us. But even more so for those who are, which are not working in the ICT sectors per se. Um, now, with this, I set out, you know, politically how, and, and uh, from a legislative point of view, how in the European Union we want to create the environment, this digital single market, which will enable us to, to, to grow, which will enable you um, in your activities immediately to uh, reach out for uh, uh, um, a big market, a market of 500 million consumers a digital single market in which it means that, like in the offline world, I can easily, just as easily, buy online or take my content along across borders in the same way as I would do at home and as a company where you will be able to sell your goods, your digital goods, your digital services across borders with the same ease that you should be able to do it at home. That is, that is the objective. Now, before finishing, I thought it would be just uh, nice to have a quick look at how Iceland is doing in, in this context. And so I have here a few figures from um, our, our scoreboard because we also, you know, you being in European economic area, 
country, we also monitor uh, your performance. And, and the red is, is, is the positive color here. I think clearly on, um, on broadband coverage, you're, you're, you're there. Uh, more can still be done for rural areas, but I think also with the specificities of, of the geography in, uh, in Iceland, this is already a quite stunning result. Um, well, I think when you go up to the really high speeds, there is still a bit of work to be done. But um, you're clearly on, on the usage of the internet, I mean, clearly uh, Iceland is amongst the, the, the top performers. It's absolutely in amongst the top performers here. Being on the left is uh, where you score very high. So in terms of digital skills, uh, you're absolutely there. And so it means, you know, that um, everything which I said about the digital single market, it applies to, to Iceland. The telecom single market applies to Iceland. Being a part of the European economic area, this legislation will apply to you. So uh, clearly, you're well prepared. You have the skills. So I can just encourage you only today to continue being innovative, you know, but start by thinking that to be successful commercially, that you need a market which has the size of the European Union, and that together we must make the best of this digital single market, us as legislators creating the conditions, but then you as entrepreneurs, as um, economic agents, as citizens, enjoy it, benefit from it to the full, and that's how also we, you know, we can best face the, the global competition. Use your strengths. The skills is clearly one. All the work which you've done in this country around, around data collection, which will surely be an advantage uh, as, as big data becomes a major economic uh, factor. And your openness, I think, with all of that, you are, you are clearly very well prepared. And a conference, an impressive conference like this, with all these participants today, and I understand 9,000 people coming to, uh, to, to see the, all the exhibits tomorrow, I think that is really very, very impressive. So congratulations and, and, and continue. Thank you very much.